you guys managed to make this work. When I went to New Zealand last, when was that? Last year, a year, year ago. Um, a number of people from many different disciplines mentioned to me that I needed to meet Yuki Kihara when they found out I was writing a book on queer performance and Yuki very generously came to a cafe and met me and Paul and spent, I think we were there for like two and a half hours. Yeah. And I, it was one of those things where I was like you know, typing mm -hmm. notes and like, oh my God, trying to get all of your wisdom. And mm -hmm. so I was super excited when I found out that San Francisco was bringing Yuki and put the motions in to get this to happen here. So I'll just do a very brief intro. There's a lot of information online. Yuki Kihara is a leading artist, um, often said to be from New Zealand because you, you were schooled at the um, Design and Technology School at what is now Massey University in Wellington, but Yuki actually grew up in Samoa and has returned there unless she's traveling around the world. So she's really not based in New Zealand anymore, but people, um, people there know her work really well. Um, and she has work in the National Museum, Te Papa in Wellington, and in most of the major museums and galleries. Um, Yuki's work addresses the uh, figure in Samoan culture, the fa Fafine, who I still don't fully understand and I never will. Um, <laughs> but it's a figure, a historic figure that goes back before colonization, which has now in some senses and some discourses dovetailed with certain arguments in queer theory and people from the West are always tempted to call this figure a trans female figure but it's much more complicated than that. Um, and Yuki's work really explores in uh, performance, photography, video, the complexities not just of that figure but of the interrelations among um, New Zealand, the colonizers, the Maori culture, the Samoan culture, etc. Um, finally, I'll just mention the amazing book called Samoan Queer Lives that she has co-edited with Dan McMillan, which, as I said to now, is making social media ablaze with commentary and uh, includes essays by Fafa Fine and other Samoan people talking about their experience. And everyone should take a look at that book. So thank you for coming. And I'll leave it at that. First of all, I would like to give thanks to our creator that has enabled us to come together this afternoon and to also acknowledge the indigenous peoples to whose land we currently occupy today. My name is Yuki Kihara. I'm an interdisciplinary artist. Uh, I would like to thank you, Amelia uh, and the Roski Art School for inviting me uh, to share my work with you uh, this evening. Um, and thank you for Marshall for driving me around all day yesterday and today. <laughs> um, it was great to have you uh, by my side. Um, and I actually have notes to read for each of the 20 slides I'm going to show you today. And then um, I don't want to be trying to projecting over there. So, uh, you know, if I sound a little bit too uh, low, then you just might have to come in, come closer, okay? Okay, so I'm going to start now. So I would like to uh, begin my presentation by briefly discussing the region and place where I currently call home, which is the independent state of Samoa in Oceania. Samoan writer Albert Wendt describes Oceania having close to 50,000 islands, over 2,800 indigenous languages, so vast it occupies one third of the Earth's surface, making it the biggest liquid continent on Earth. The island's entirety within the Moana, otherwise known as the Pacific Ocean, can be divided into three main groups known as Micronesia, meaning small islands, Melanesia, meaning dark islands, and Polynesia, meaning many islands. Tongan philosopher uh, Ipeli Haofa describes these divisions due to, end quote, Continental Europeans and Americans drew imaginary lines across the sea, making the colonial boundaries that confined the ocean peoples to tiny spaces for the first time. 
These boundaries today defined the island states and territories of the Pacific. I have just used the term ocean peoples because our ancestors who had lived in the Pacific for over 2,000 years viewed the world as a sea of islands rather than islands in the sea, end of quote. Samoa is an archipelago located in the southwest Pacific, 2,000, uh, sorry, 2,300 kilometer north northwest of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and 3,700 kilometer south of the Kingdom of Hawaii. <coughs> Archaeological findings suggest that Pacific people, including Samoans, originated from Southeast Asia, who made their way across the Pacific, uh, Pacific in ocean-faring canoes 3,000 years ago. Over the millennia. The Samoan people engaged in trade, battles, and intermarriages of nobility within the neighboring islands of Fiji and Tonga. The interweaving of cultures and bloodline has helped to strengthen the ties of these South Pacific island nations. Dutch explorer Ro uh, Jacob Rojveen was the first European to sight the islands in 1722, but it wasn't until 1830 when the London missionary John Williams arrived in the islands of Savai that the Christian gospel had made an impact on Samoan life. Samoans are now a devoutly religious people with much time devoted to church activities. For many Samoans, Christianity and Samoa, or the Samoan way, are inextricably interwoven. After, the, after years of civil war, the Berlin Treaty was signed in 1899 between Germany and the United States to annex the Samoan archipelago. Western Samoa became a German colony between 1900s and 1914, and Eastern Samoa became uh, American Samoa, which continues to be a, uh, a free association of the territories of the United States of America. After the outbreak of the First World War, New Zealand occupied Western Samoa from the small German company stationed on the islands, and following the end of the war, took admi admi administrative control on behalf of the United Nations from 1918 until the independence on the 1st of January, 1962. Western Samoa became the first Pacific nation to gain independence. From 1997, the nation formerly known as Western Samoa dropped the title of Western from its name and became the independent state of Samoa. Samoa celebrates its independence every year in June. Samoa's official languages are Samoan and English. The population is just under 200,000 people, with Samoans being the indigenous majority in the country by 85%. The traditional culture of Samoa is a communal way of life based on Samoa or the Samoan way, which is a unique social political culture. In Samoan culture, most activities are done together. There are two main parts of the Samoan culture, which includes faith and family. The Fale Samoa, or the classical Samoan architecture, contains no walls and up to 20 people may sleep on the ground at the same Fale. One's family is viewed as integral part of a person's life. The Ainga, or the extended family, uh, always works together, and elders in the family are greatly respected and hold higher status. Today, the economy in Samoa is based, on, is based on subsistence farming and exports that include agriculture, including fishery and forestry products, and tourism. However, the country uh, remained uh, dependent on foreign aid and remittances from Samoan diaspora living in New Zealand, Australia, and the US, which all have former colonial ties to Samoa. The remittances from the Samoan diaspora contributes to more than 20% of the Samoan local economy. And the average minimum wage in Samoa is $2.30, which is like in the States will be about like $1. So it's considered by the United Nations as a developing country. Approximately 70% of Samoan's population and infrastructure are located in low-lying coastal areas, which makes them extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Samoa is currently, currently experiencing the sea level rise of up to 4 millimeters a year since 1993, then the global average of 2.8 to uh, 3.6 millimeter. By 2030, it's expected to rise up to 15 centimeters higher than they are today, 
although scientists estimate this could be much higher than higher still, given the unknown impact of the melting ice sheets in Antarctica. This year marks the 124th anniversary of the artist Paul Coogan's arrival in Auckland, Aotearoa, New Zealand, in August 1895, where he spent 10 days en route to Tahiti for the second and the last uh, final time. During his brief time in the city, uh, Gugan observed and made detailed sketches of Maori, which is the indigenous people of New Zealand, and Pacific treasures held at the Auckland Art Gallery and Auckland Museum. He also took a small but a vital collection of new images when he left Auckland, several of which, which later appeared in his major paintings. One of these paintings, entitled Three Tahitians, which features a male figure in the middle with his back facing the uh, towards the viewer, directly references a 19th century photograph depicting an unnamed Samoan man with the pea, or the customary tattoo for Samoan men, taken by photographer Thomas Andrew. Andrew's photograph could have been one of the items Gugan collected during his time in Auckland. My collage work entitled Street Tahiti Samoans after Paul Gugan seamlessly merges together two male figures depicted by Gugan and Andrews to observe their similarities as a way to critique Gugan's intent behind his paintings and the context of the social political climate he was part of. Although Gugan never set foot in Samoa, there have been a, a number of artists from Western countries who have arrived in Samoa and produced paintings that, like Gugan's work, envisioned a romantic life in a timeless village untouched by Western colonization and Christianity. I used to, uh, I used to see Gugan's work featured in tourism paraphernalia like mugs and postcards and cruise ships advertisements outside of Samoa. However, I never took notice of it until I first came across this actual painting in 2008 when I presented my solo exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Manahata, which is the indigenous name of Manhattan, in New York. I remember thinking how strange it was to be in the front of his painting as if time and, state, uh, and, time and space had collapsed. Here we were as artists from two different parts of the world having a dialogue in two different moments in history. I also remember seeing Gugan's painting at the Guggenheim in MoMA, noticing how I was the only Pacific Islander in the gallery filled with people, with hardly any Pacific Islanders or indigenous people in sight. For centuries, non-indigenous peoples, anthropologists and museum curators, curators have represented the Pacific to non-indigenous audiences and exoticized them. During the same time in Manahata, I met a handful of Pacific people who shared with me the experience of living as an ethnic minority in Turtle Island, which is an indigenous name for the United States, being kept from across, uh, being kept from accessing a variety of social services while being ignored by government policies due to their low population count. Similar factors led to the United States and France to treat the Pacific Islands as a military playground, remote islands far removed from the populated Western metropolitan centers leading them to conduct more than 190 nuclear tests in the region in the 1940s till 1970s. This continues today with the Pacific situated in the midst of the threat of nuclear war between the United States or the Turtle Island and North Korea, all in a region well known for tourism. Pacific indigenous scholar Teresia Tiaiwa describes a symbolic relationship between military forces and tourism as militarism which ensure, which, uh, with her description, uh, quote, ensures the smooth running of a tourism industry and that the same tourist industry masks the military force behind it, unquote. As Teaiwa stated, tourism in the Pacific is riddled with layers of contradiction. Tourism in Samoa in particular offers an escape and much needed replenishment and relaxation pro provided inside the walls of luxury resorts to exhausted tourists from developed countries. Outside of the, walls of, outside of the resort walls, however, local Samoans des desperately cling to their lives while being ravaged by natural disasters and cyclone, such as the recent Cyclone Gita with the slides that you saw a couple of minutes ago, and sea level rise fueled by climate change, mostly caused by carbon emissions from the very developed countries from which the tourists originate. 
Samoa continues to grapple with the idea of sustainable development, finding a balance between maintaining and preserving culture and natural resources while responding to the needs of the local economy that relies heavily on tourism. So you see here the Pacific region is being sort of guganified. Yeah? So this is like one of many, many ads that continues to you know, perpetuate this idea of the Pacific region as this feminine recreation, recreational space. The this tourism, uh, this tourism uh, not only serves to commodify the culture, but also extract natural resources and further impact and further the impact of climate change, including ocean acidification, coral bleaching, and sea level rise. So in Samoa, we don't have any corals at all because they've been bleached. And then the cyclone and the natural disasters have came and broken them all up. So in order for our fishermen to actually go look for fish, they actually have to travel outside of the economic boundary, which sets them off to like really dangerous uh, deep sea areas. I remember during the 1990s, the majority of tourists uh, that came to Samoa were from Europe. But these days, the increasing number is made up of the Samoan diaspora that visits the islands to reconnect with their families, to undertake cultural obligations such as machai, machai chiefly title bestowments, and have a holiday at the same time before returning to join the diasporic communities. I have also felt Gugan's legacy in the Pacific indirectly when I have been approached by several people to consider applying to sail with the Gugan, Paul Gugan Cruises, a luxury cruise line uh, to Tahiti and the Marquesas Island. So they basically look for um, anybody that is, uh, you know, have some historical knowledge about the Pacific to actually join the cruise for free. Uh, in return, uh, you know, they would be there to like introduce like stats about the islands. Yeah. I've always wanted to travel to Tahiti and the Marquesas Islands, but never been able to afford it. So perhaps joining the cruise is one of the way, one of the ways for me to experience the islands and several visit several sites, including Gugan's grave, located in the Marquesas Highland of Hipaoa, and Tapu Tapu Atea Marae complex, where ceremonial uh, center uh, for the island of Raiatea, Raiatea, sorry where uh, indigenous navigators across the Pacific come together and forge links to strengthen practices of indigenous navigation. As a Samoan, however, I have, to my be, I have to be mindful that when I step into another Pacific island, I have to respect the ancestral and cultural ties that Tahiti and the Marquesas has with Samoa, uh, which, uh, which have undergone similar history of colonialism, missionization, and cultural revitalization. Gugan's life in Tahiti and the Marquesas was an experience from a position of privilege at a time when Samoans and other indigenous peoples were being exhibited, exoticized, and dehumanized in human zoos, in world exposition and performances across Europe and the Turtle Island, including the California Midwinter International Exposition in 1894 held at the Golden Gate Park, where the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco is uh, standing at the moment where Samoan performers were imaged in ways that, in similar to Gugan's work, created stereotypes of Pacific Islanders. Gugan was inspired to travel to, uh, was, Gugan was inspired to travel outside of Europe after visiting a human zoo in Paris, and human zoos and museums were collaboratively to exhibit indigenous peoples regardless of whether they were dead or alive. Indigenous peoples today cannot be expected to live in peace when ancestral remains are held in museums and they do not have a voice in the interpretation of their own visual culture. Okay, so I've given you some context about Samoa and Bugan, and I'm gonna to talk to you about my uh, current video work entitled First Impression Paul Bugan, that's currently um, on display at the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. And it's currently um, screening in conjunction with a major survey of Paul Gugan's work entitled Gugan, A Spiritual Journey. Okay. Um, my single channel video work entitled First Impressions Paul Gugan was commissioned by the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco and Nai Glyptotech in Copenhagen, um, currently on display at the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. 
Filmed in Upolu Island, Samoa in July last year, five-part episodic talk show captures the candid interviews with select members of the Fafafine community about their first impressions of select paintings by Paul Gauguin, some of which believe to feature and depict the Tahitian Mahu, otherwise known in the Western context as a third gender. Fafafine are an indigenous queer minority which I belong to in Samoa, culturally known to be gifted in the spirit of more than one gender or third gender. The term is also used broadly today to describe those who are in the Western context, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and queer people today. The term Fafafine also translates as, uh, quote, in the manner of a woman, unquote and often applied to biological males who express their gender as a woman, while fa'atsama, on the other hand, mm -hmm. translates as in the manner of a man, and is often applied to biological females who express their gender as a man. It's my belief that the term fa'afafiri and fa'atsama was developed in response to Western contact and colonialism as a method to, uh, to categorize and differentiate those outside of Western cisgender binary and heteronormativity seen as the status quo. Prior to Western contact, there was no need among Samoans to mark people for their difference. What did, con what did and continue to matter for most Samoans are one's contribution to the family and community, not who one appears as or attracted to. My initial criteria, criteria for selecting Gulgan paintings featured in the video work was to, was, uh, to, was to choose those I felt re resembled um, the Fafafine, or the, you know, or like the Tahitian Mahu, which is the Samoan equivalent of a Fafafine. But I ended up including paintings that portray a variety of natives because most, if not all, natives portrayed by Gugan are all fictitious. Gugan's romantic fascination with the Mahu uh, points to his fantasy of an exotic racial other. This fascination continues to echo in the works of many Western documentary filmmakers anthropologists and travel writers who travel to Samoa in search of a fafafine whom they assume to possess a primitive gender and sexuality and are living close to nature as measured against a civilized Western patriarchy. In her book, Sexual Encounters, Pacific Texts, Modern Sexualities, scholar Lee Wallace argues that sexual encounters between colonialists and the natives in the Pacific have shaped the Western notion of gender and sexuality, including homosexuality and transgenderism. In fact, this very terminology is based on the Western medical disease model, where the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is the American Psychiatric Disorder Guidebook, classified homosexuality as a mental illness in 1973 and continued to do so until 1987. The Diagnostic Manual classified transgender identity as a mental illness in 1968 and continues to do so until today. First Impressions is part of a larger body of work that I've developed over the years. Amongst others, a photographic series entitled Fafafine in the Manner of a Woman, to which I used my body as an artistic material to masquerade in a variety of characters inspired by, by uh, Samoan <coughs> colonial photography. And a publication entitled Samoan Queer Lives, featuring 14 autobiographical chapters from Fafafine and LGBTIQ Samoans based in uh, Samoa, American Samoa, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, Turtle Island, co-edited by myself and Dan Talababak Malin, published by Little Island Press in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, which was first launched in Samoa in uh, December 2018. Gugan's vision of a genderless Pacific paradise is an ideal far removed from the reality of what many Fafafine in Samoa face today. On June 27, 2016, an early morning candlelight procession was held in Apia, the capital city of Samoa, in Upolu Island, led by the members of the Samoa Fafafini Association. They were holding banners with messages such as, end media violation of Fafafine, social justice and peace, end violence and discrimination of Fafafine. 
The banners were in response to a controversy over the reporting of the death of Janine Tuivaiki, a 20-year-old student in Fafafine who died of a suspected suicide published on the front cover of the Sunday Samoan local newspaper. The Sunday Salmon published in its front page an unblurred photograph of Tuivaiki's dead body and also referred to Tuivaiki as a man throughout the story. The reporting sent shockwaves across Samoa, especially given that the Fafafine community had recently celebrated in, in replacing the Crimes Coordinance Act, Ordinance Act of 1961, a law enforced during the New Zealand's colonial administration of Samoa, which criminalized impersonation of a female by any males in Samoa. The law was used to prosecute Fafafine with fines and imprisonment, although it had effectively stopped being enforced by the police in the early 1980s. The Samoan Fafafine Association said the reappeal of the law was a huge celebration for the Fafafine community and a vindiction for the families who have lost members to acts of violence. Today, the social equilibrium that had long existed across the gender spectrum prior to the arrival of missionaries and colonizers had been greatly disturbed by, among others, visual representations of Fafafine by the media and inflammatory televangelism channel in Samoa run by religious conservatives. Recently, Fafafine have increasingly been used as a scapegoat by religious and political leaders who blame the causes of homosexuality, HIV AIDS, climate change, and other social problems on Fafafine whenever Samoan society is under social, political, cultural, and economic pressure from the West. It is my hope that my work can contribute to the local and global dialogue on how gender identity can be a catalyst to question how one society is organized and structured under Western patriarchy. We must find ways to decolonize from institutional structures that remain stronghold in Samoa, the Pacific, and its diverse groups of people, which keeps all of them from truly, free, from truly realizing their freedom and sovereignty. In closing, my thoughts are echoed in what Tahitian poet, playwright, and activist Henry Hedo, who once said, I would like today's culture to look back to its roots, to its source, which is Polynesian culture. From this encounter between the past and the present, something new will be born. Our fourth painting, but I want to to John, John, please bring the next painting. This painting is called Two Tahitian Women. Dallas, what's your first impression? Two Tahitian trans women? Adela, Benny, Papa Fingy, Fiko Lua, or not one of our father, I know where I'm going
This is the white woman's <laughs> story. This is heterosexual. This painting was taken back in um, 1899. Oh, mm -hmm. gorgeous. By Fogart. I don't know what they did. What was it? Oh, was it in So, in. You know what? I'm not for Fogart. If you look at these photos, why were they taken? I said, these paintings, why were they painted? What was the purpose? Oh, if we die. They are called Gunning, a couple pretty for fasting, make up, who supreme kept on the mark, no, no, I am. When I lay, what can you get a fatu, you know, more than you pop from under the wind? I wouldn't know. I can't come out, I don't know how. Who's a family thing, I walk up and found out, I can't have a pay. So, 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 Therefore, the, the cock, the dog, the cock. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the books remain. Yeah. Oh, dear. I have. Uh, okay. Dallas. I think it's a beautiful photo. It's. I mean, painting it. It's very pure. You know, back then,
But I must say that I must comment these both these two girls as mentioned by the Miss. They're very beautiful. Ah, I wonder what's in there. Make up my whole guy had to you know. Picture up my imagination. Say we say yeah, the whole male or whole Miss Awayo Kaka because it's quite my it's quite impossible. Well, the Taishan girls too are. Like also for your bills, I have more every day. I'm trying not to like you ladies and your brother. How about round applause for that? I'm so happy because I just called you uh, beautiful or face. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. <laughs> 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 and then I'm allowed us. It's quite contradictory because when I be when I offer my phone for me, Lalo, and I find out the answer to why. I think the whole Christianity came to Psalm 1840. It's but they went to Tahiti before I came here. Yeah. So I think um, covering they up. They were still trying to maintain the yeah. path of the yeah, So I think at the time they were still kind of ah, in between. Yeah. Ah, definitely. Mm -hmm. in, yeah, in the transitioning from the uh, traditional ways into the modernized mm -hmm. uh, ways. So I think yeah. it's like the half and half kind of four. I think Paul had an eye for the future. Mm -hmm. Like I think this is very such a very fashion um, trend kind mm -hmm. of thing. You know, it's just like the modern at the top, at the bottom, yeah. and then like and then the, the traditional, traditional at, the top. at the top. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're glad we have to Um, Sandora, looking at their hair. Well, are, are, are you regretting you know having short hair? I adore her. Mm. Because for all my fabric, you know, all of flowers trying to make you look good. <laughs> are you regretting not having <sighs> longer hair? I'm not gonna deal for that way or or But it's a fear of poor my yang. Okay, this is here because comfortable. Comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. The trendsetter. Yeah. Yeah. Right, all depends for ya. Yeah? Mm. Trends for mm. What well, full sleep or low? Well, that's why you don't get like yesterday, you're a No, I want to also be a Fafa female, and I'm proud to be a Fafa female. It's okay. Born to be white. No, no. I was born this way, born to Lady Gaga. <laughs> I, okay, I'll just critique a little. I love the whole background, the colors, and power coordination, and how, you know, the props have been incorporated, like when I don't mean a lot of gang it, it appears to be like it's a karma. Do you think they're sisters or mother and daughter or do you think they're lesbians or it could be anything. Could be anything. Before I want to be enough. I think I was a man. Look at the bowl of bill, this is red when you see as loud as you see. There's a whole it's of the idea for that. I don't know the idol is a wedding of maybe the idea of Gilma from war. It's a bowl here, for you know, but it's comfortable for with Gamma Ah, they want I always say, wedding. I do a virgin of the castle. I don't want to say, 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 I would have to say, you know, poor Bugan's talent is just amazing. I mean, like, who would ever thought if I didn't make sure so they see that because it's so easy for Ali Mike? I think this is delivering a message. What message do you think of this painting is portraying? Well, mm -hmm. I think it's the, it's a mark of the, you know, the whole new Christian ideology. <laughs> to me personally, I think it's the unholy trinity that's really difficult. Okay. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Do you think this painting will sell, Shelley? Yes, definitely. You? Yes. I? Kelly? Well, of course it would. Look at those girls. And you? Who has not purchased a painting? Who has not purchased a painting? Who has not purchased a painting? Like, to your face, so of teeth. And you? Oh, yeah. Fuck down. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you again for your time. This. Afternoon. <laughs> Appreciate the time that you've spent uh, with us on first impressions. 
That's it for us, Samoa. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is First Impressions and Stage Presentation of Cool STEM. We'll pass it. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for uh, being here. And I'm happy to take a question. First question, I would like it to come from an indigenous person. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no indigenous people in the room, <laughs> then I would have the first question come from a woman. reinforces this idea of this political imperative and if you could talk more about how that shapes your work um, you know without the work just becoming a didactic illustration of the argument which it's not so how do you get from you know that intense political imperative to the complexity and aesthetic qualities of the work not so much this new piece but the older work like the well, I guess it all kind of stems from life experience and in trying to make sense of what my life, how it had shaped my life, what, uh, what, how the outside forces have shaped my, mm -hmm. uh, my personal experience. And then, so I kind of find that when I talk about my personal experience, people kind of find it really threatening. Um, so it's easier for people to understand uh, my life experience through art rather than actually me talking about it because when I talk about it, they feel like they're being attacked. So it's easier if I make art uh, because we're actually projecting our opinions on something else, not about me personally. Um, and then... Um, you know, I would try and sort of back up, back up my life experience by uh, uh, stats and research and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, um, like, I'm not academically trained. I'm formally trained as a fashion designer at a polytechnic. Um, so everything that I do uh, is very self-taught. But what I have learned from, uh, from uh, studying as a fashion designer, however, um, is how I am able to um, you know, use cloth as a sculptural material mm -hmm. um, and you know, working with the body. And then I think that's why I ended up sort of using my own body in my own work. Mm -hmm. um, but now um, I'm more sort of moving towards more behind the camera now, like you know, writing and directing. And, Working with you know DOP and mm -hmm. sound people, sound D, grip, you know, you you would know all of that, yeah. Uh, because um, I, uh, I mean, I got exposed to um, filmmaking when I was um, uh, working as a wardrobe department uh, in uh, commercials and movies, um, and making uh, costumes for theater plays and dance. So. 
um, I got exposed to like the logistics of how backstage happens mm -hmm. and how you know things things behind the you know productions happen and then I was to, I was able to and then I did that for like more than five years mm -hmm. so I began to understand how narrative could be constructed mm -hmm you know, in front of me. And then, so I would take all of that. So, you know, all my former colleagues, you know, that I used to work in theater and in cinema, you know, I would grab them, can you work on my project? And then, are you sure? And, yeah, he's laughing because he knows all about that. Yeah. Um, and then, um, so, I, you know, that was, uh, First Impressions had like a crew of 27 people and had a great time because I managed to get like all my family involved because my mom was catering and two of my, um, yeah, and yeah, my mom was a catering, like my auntie was a production driver, two of my cousins were carpenters. Um, um, yeah, um, you know, I had like friends, you know, work as a, you know, DOP, like director of photography, associate producer, project manager. Um, yeah, so it was like a real family uh, and uh, effort. Can you talk more about that fabulous set? Oh, okay. So that's the actually and the yeah, and the yeah, sure. Huh. Um, so the set, uh, the the initial location was a classroom at the National University of Samoa, um, and we literally built the set inside the classroom. So it happened during the second semester break. Um, and I knew somebody, so I'm affiliated to the Center for Samoan Studies, and I do quite a few projects with them. And then they were able to give me um, the classroom for uh, for free. Um, and then so I had to uh, take my two other uh, cousins with me uh, into the classroom, and we measured the room, and we actually literally have to build the prop from scratch. Um, and then so the video work was commissioned by the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco in Glyptotech. <coughs> Um, but um, I kind of miscalculated the budget. So I actually had to go out and uh, look for local sponsorship. So um, I managed to get a, a stationery company and a, depart and a local department store in the island to also pitch into the production um, funds, um, which I thought was a brilliant idea because now there's actually like a local uh, contribution and not just being sort of funded by North America and Europe. Um, that you know, it actually had some like local value in it. Um, so yeah, and the reason why I made it into like five episodes was that um, I kind of calculated that okay, so there's like six people, two minutes each, you know, and that's all you're going to say. And then so you put one painting in front of these group of people, right? And then they can just go on forever, <laughs> you know. And then you just don't know, you just don't want to cut it because it's so the content is so good. It was so hard to um, edit it down to 13 minutes. And the reason why it's edited down to 13 is so that once it's actually on TV, the TV can actually make money by putting two minute ads in it. Yeah. And then so uh, my primary audience for my work are Samoans, Samoans that live in the island. Um, and if people feel that my work you know, resonates globally, then everybody else takes it. And then so when I negotiated with the, with this with the two museums, I told them, well, you do understand that my primary audience is the Samoan. So, you know, it's going to be in Samoan language. It will be English subtitles. There will be cultural, cultural translation things. I mean, it was quite interesting sitting back and listening to you guys laughing because there are things that I, was, I just find it really hilarious. But obviously, it doesn't really come through because of the cultural translation. You know, it's, it's lost in translation. But I mean, like, you know, you just have to be a Samoan to understand it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you yeah. give us one example, though, of what's lost, what we're missing? Um, like some, I, mm, I don't know, just some of the sexual innuendos and, and the inside jerks. Yeah. It's actually on right now. That's amazing. I, oh, think thank that, you. I think it's amazing that that institution is pro providing that context, and I wonder how that relationship got started. Okay, so uh, the co curator is Christina Helmich, and then so she looks after the Department of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, the three continents, one person. Like. <laughs> I mean, anyway, uh, so her speciality, her specialist research is actually in Hawaii. And then, um, 
uh, we met at a conference like maybe 10 years ago and then um, uh, I had a residency in New York at the ISCP and then she flew me over to San Francisco to meet with her and I was able to pursue some uh, research into their uh, collections because I also do a lot of collections research because I'm also interested in uh, uh, production uh, and interpretation of heritage arts but you guys call it uh, folkloric perhaps um, and then uh, so we have you know you know I'm interested in weaving techniques all of that uh, carving um, and uh, so we just maintain relationship um, apparently the glyptotech approached uh, the San Francisco Museum um, about uh, exhibiting their Gugan collection alongside the Oceanic collection of the museum. So that's how the pairing came together. And the museum also already had some uh, Gugan sketches as well. So Glyptotech kind of felt like, because they're very specific about the institutions they want to partner with to make sure that um, you know the partnering institution not only has the budget, but actually has the collections to you know, to uh, to ground it within the American context, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how it happened. Hi. Hi. Um, I wonder if you could share with us how you went about casting the individuals who participate in okay. the episodes. And that are was, they the same in each one, or are they different in each one? They were same in each mm -hmm. each one. Uh, it was very hard because you know, um, we well, first of all, I know them all. And then I, you know, and after, I mean, you know, I screened this in Samoa in front of, in front of the Fafafini community. And they all asked me, like, why didn't you cast me? <laughs> 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 you know, like some of them, like, threatened to unfriend me on Facebook. <laughs> it's like no hard feelings. There's always the next one. But it's like, oh, my gosh, like, now I have to take my um, But um, I, I knew all of them. Um, some of them were acquaintances. Um, um, I was also a judge in a Fafafina beauty pageant, so um, you know I knew a couple of them. So um, I guess you you guys here have balls. We have pageants, um, and uh, that's the outlet for the Fafafina community. You know to uh, to uh, have visibility in the Samoan community. Um, I deliberately chose all five of them because they all have uh, different personalities and I know they would all say different things. But I kind of find that Charlize and Dallas were a little bit similar. Um, so I was at first quite um, worried that they might actually end up saying the same thing, but I think it kind of worked out. Yeah. And it, yeah, uh, you know, there were times when Sandora kind of felt like, you know, she was kind of left out, but I mean, you know, she can handle herself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the interesting thing that the first impression provides is that it's not really about Paul Gugan, but it's about the Fafa Fingers and their worldview and how they see their how they see their world. Um, and then so you can you know you can see like how they interact with each other. I mean I guess uh, the, just going back to the last question about like you know how, like you know the, you know what was lost in cultural translation. Like they were using like a lot of. Um, uh, like Fafafine slangs or vernacular that is very specific to our community. Um, that, um, you know, we make a lot of slangs um, so that nobody else understands it, but we do. So we have our own Samoan Fafafine language that most Samoan people don't understand, but we do. So it's just like a code language. Um, yeah. So I guess, you know, that's one of the things that, um, yeah, you guys didn't get because you're not part of the community, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, what else can I tell you? Maybe, yes, you had a question over there? Hi. Yes. Hi, um, I was just wondering, because like, like, with your presentation, it, a lot of it was providing the context for your work. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how you feel about, like, I, do you, about, because it was a very like pointed, like, um, like intentional, like, this is like the historical and like colonial background, right? So how do you, and which obviously adds so much to your work, but I was just wondering how do you like address that when you exhibit it? Or, if it, or do you just like let, leave it to, to the viewer and the institution to make it different? I mean, I work very closely with the curator about how it's been interpreted, um, you know, from the wall text to the essays. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, 
I mean, for example, like the show that I'm currently showing at the moment with the Gugan work, I mean, you know, it's a Gugan solo show. Um, but uh, when it came to the wall text that I made sure, that, you know, that people understood what, uh, fa, fa, you know, what is fa, fa fine and who the audience was for and da 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 da. Um, so um, it really depends on the situation, really. Like I don't really have kind of like a standard. Well, the standard thing is that, you know, I want to see the wall text and I want to see the essay, you know. Um, so that, um, you know, and it's also... Um, and it's not to really interfere with the curator, but it's to actually help them, yeah. you know, um, so that, um, you know, they get it right. Yeah. But my next project, I'm actually going to do like an all Samoan language project because I'm actually like quite tired of actually using the English language because as soon as, you know, we have to put English subtitles, I kind of have to dumb it down, mm. you know. So that's why I just prefer... You know, to um, you know, work with the audience that I that I you know that that both love and hate me. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, so, for many artists in marginalized spaces, you often have to work through your own trauma or your own um, your own personal history just to create art. So, how have you navigated that? I've done it since 1997, so I kind of got the hang of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, they have certainly become a material for my work, but uh, uh, I. But you know, I also don't want to be sort of really inward. You get what I mean? I'm also interested in how how others experience uh, life on on this planet. Yeah. But you know, I work from the space that I know. So, hey. Um, it's kind of similar um, to that question. I just kind of wanted to know how did you get into art making, and how did you decide that you wanted to process the images that you had been in, been internalizing, and then kind of like flip it and critique it. Um, okay. Just a little bit more about the process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, I initially wanted to be an artist, but my dad said, um, so my dad's Japanese and my father's, uh, my, my father's Sam, my father is Japanese and my mother's Samoan, hence I have a Japanese name. Um, and I wanted to be an artist, and my dad said, don't, because there's no money in it. And then, so, um, I've decided, okay, so what's the closest thing I can do to art? And I thought, okay, maybe I, I'll be a fashion designer and I can treat fabric like sculptural okay. material. But when I actually did like four years of like, you know, bachelors of fashion design, they were more about trying to make us ready to go into factories to make one garment like 500 times. It's like, hmm, that's just like kills my creativity. Um, so that's why I, I was like, once I graduated, I was glued to costuming because at least it was exciting. Um, you know, the money was shit, but you know, I had really, you know, I had a great time. Um, and, uh, and in my own time, I was fusing, you know, like I wasn't really, f I mean, I guess when the first group of artists that I researched were fashion designers and those were like Issei Miyake, mm -hmm. Vivian Westwood, um, Alexander McQueen, Claude Montana, um, you know, Comte des Garçons, like Jean-Paul Gaultier, um, and um, I wasn't necessarily interested for the fashion trend, but I was more interested in the performativity of, of the catwalk and the theater and all of that. Um, and then how, and how, like what they, you know, what does it tell about us when fashion designers make something like that? Mm -hmm. You know, I was more interested of, of, of that social aspect, the, the psychological aspect of fashion and, 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 and what it's doing to, to our society or how it's reflecting us. Um, so, uh, and there wasn't any space for that in fashion because every six months you had to change, you know? And then, um, so I was, uh, but I may, I began to make series of uh, uh, t-shirts that for, kind of followed, uh, I think what you call it in, the, uh, in America, logo jamming. Um, you know, where you you uh, manipulate an existing logo to mean something else. 
And then, so I did like a lot of that. Um, like for example, like, um, you know, in uh, New Zealand, we have a supermarket called Countdown. And, you know, I would, I would uh, change stuff, you know, I would make it the same font and call it coconut, which is like a derogatory term for, you know, to describe Pacific Island migrants mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and then, um, so I did a lot of those kinds of logo jamming t-shirts which uh, intersected between political message, contemporary art, um, uh, and, and, and fashion. Um, and then um, and I exhibited that in a gallery space, and then I kind of, and I said to myself, you know what, I think this gallery space is my platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I began to make like collage, um, uh, which also referenced like, uh, you know, history of regalia in Pacific culture. Um, and then just took off from there, yeah. I think what what was really beneficial for me when I was at fashion school is that we had to do a history of costume paper. So we had to learn about like, you know, from Egyptian to Roman to Renaissance to Baroque to all these kinds of things. Um, uh, and it was uh, when I was given an assignment to look into uh, regalias from, you know, any part of the world and I decided to look into regalia from Samoa that was held in um, museums across New Zealand, and then that's when I got really interested in, in looking at you know the history of textiles and and all of that, and then um, that kind of gave me the backbone to understand. Um, that gave me kind of like the analytical tools to to uh, dissect ideas. Yeah, I hope that's making sense. I'll ask more tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm showing you this slide, Someone Queer Lives, because initially the book was supposed to be called Fafafine Memoirs. Um, but because the publisher said that, well, you know, no, well, no one understands what Fafafine is, and we want a broad audience, so Dan and I decided that we'll stick to the word queer. Um, so it's just a, a door that people can open to explore more things. Um, you know, because, you know, the lack of the English language that, you know, that can't explain the complexity of our universe, uh, we kind of have to dumb it down to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, it's just a gateway uh, to an idea, you know. It's not end all because, I mean, I'm very fortunate for the fact that I get to go back to an island where the first language is Samoan, you know, but not all indigenous spaces are like that, you know what I mean? So, um, uh, and especially people in the diaspora, um, you know, they're not, you know, speaking, you know, their indigenous language, you know, as actively as they would like. So, you know, we try to be as broad as possible. Um, the interesting thing is that when I had the book launch of, of, of this book uh, in uh, Apia, in, in my island, um, you know, many Fafafines came, um, you know, they looked at the book, you know, congratulations, please sign it, da-da-da-da-da. And I saw one Fafafine, and they said, hey, which, do, you know, and they went through the book, and I saw this, like, you know, list of people who contributed to the, to the book. And as I was asking one Fafafine, I said, oh, so do you know any, any of these, uh, do you know any of these guys here? And they said, oh, yeah, I know this, this, and this. And they said, oh, do you think you will read them? Like, I said, oh, I don't know. But, but I think, you know, this book is good for girls that can read English. Mm. Oh, you know, my heart just went. You know, like, I did this to empower us, but if I made it in English, it's not like every Fafafine can read it. 
you know? When my first, you know, our first language of our island is Samoan, and then I have a book in English, it's like, the fuck is that about, Yuki? Yeah. It was so disappointing, and it was kind of like a major, major blur. But if you think about it, many of the books about Samoa are not in Samoan. Because, you know, like, because people think there's no market for it. And besides, like, um, it's not just Fafa Fingers, but like Samoa across the board, we have a really low literacy, uh, literacy level, um, in not just in English, but it's also in Samoan as well. So um, I've decided that my next project was going to be all in Samoan. Yeah. And then I'm actually going to, it's going to be a, a series of uh, 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 web series, uh, documentaries, uh, focusing on uh, local artists in the island. Um, and it's going to be about like maybe uh, uh, four to five minutes, because I've been uh, looking at the relationship between Samoans and digital culture, particularly in Facebook. And then so when you... Um, you know, look at how they, you know, use data. Like for example, like, you know, when they film something, it's always up to like three to four minutes and it's never like 10 minutes because data is really expensive in the island. So if anybody goes to film anything, it will always kind of like stop about like four to five, you know? Unless like, you know, you pay 10 tala and you get 24 hour access and it's like, you know? And then so like, okay then, so average someone can afford to watch a clip on Facebook for about four to five minutes, then I would actually make uh, these series of uh, artist documentaries, or I call it visual essays, because I also work as a curator. So I was going to make uh, visual essays uh, about local artists in the island. And then so in the island, I mean, there are artist-run spaces and, and galleries. Um, and we, have, we do have a, a, a museum, Museum of Samoa, but they are mainly uh, interested in uh, showing archives and uh, historical material. Uh, and not necessarily contemporary art. And in contemporary art is usually shown in uh, gallery-run spaces, I mean, which is great. Um, but um, I feel that, you know, if I want to reach like a wider audience, then Facebook is going to be my gallery. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I have more questions about it, but I'll ask you tomorrow. <laughs> it's a very fun. Um, Yuki, I wonder if you could tell us, because the uh, show in San Francisco opened in November. Yes. What, the, how, what has the reception been to your work within the Gauguin Museum, with your, with your, yeah. within the exhibition? Very interesting. Um, I had a person of color uh, write a really long letter saying that my video work was humiliating the minority people. Oh, really? Yeah. Because uh, my video work, you know, uh, you know, is not intelligent, it's frivolous, it's on the surface that it's a, it's a bad representation of Pacific people. So they must have looked at my Japanese name and thought that I was like non-indigenous um, person, filming indigenous community and trying to like make money from them and da 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 da. If only they could see me now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and there was that. Um, uh, there was one review in the Washington, Washington Post that said that um, the, the only good thing about the about the show was my video, so that was a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I actually sat um, in the audience uh, in, in the gallery show, um, you know, just to you know just pretend that I was an audience, just to look at like all the audience members. And some people get the joke, and some people don't. Mm. Yeah, and some people just look, and once they see some androgynous person, they just get disgusted and stand up and leave. But I mean, you know, I, mean, I think any reaction is a good reaction. But I mean, I guess that maybe I was wondering because of all the places I can think of, San Francisco might be the most sympathetic audience okay. in terms of queer and trans and everything. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there had been like just word of mouth or if you had heard from the curators there what, what people had thought. Because it's pretty, I think it's really interesting that they did this to yeah. begin with. I mean, Christina was quite brave, you know, to work with me, um, because she initially asked me to contribute an essay, um, and then so I asked her, well, can you give me the, like, the object list to, like, what you have in there? And then, you know, I saw the list, it's like, oh, well, what's the indigenous response? 
Um, and then said, okay, well, um, you know, you asked me to contribute in the catalog. How about if I contribute an artwork so that my essay in the catalog is my artist statement for the artwork? Mm -hmm. That's smart. Yeah. And then so, um, so what do you want to do? Like, well, well, well. <laughs> yeah. And then so um, the whole idea of, um, you know, bringing a group of Fafa Fingers uh, together, um, you know, who's never been to a museum, who's never been to the United States, who's never been to Europe, don't know what a museum is, don't care for Gugan. Um, I mean, you know, essentially you're critiquing a painting that's three times, uh, you know, the, the, the net worth of an export market in Samoa, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, so it's really interesting to show to an audience, you know, the, the audience is really interesting because they were more like in their late 70s. Yeah, they were like a lot of like, you know, mature audience. I think it's because they were all kind of grew up in modernism. You know, maybe like Gugan was their Damien Hirst back in the day or something <laughs> like that, you know? Um, and then, uh, yeah, so it was, it was really interesting, like lots of elderly crowd um, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, and, you know, and I think they were like really well-read people. I mean, like I did a panel discussion with like 270 people. And then, you know, they were quite like, you know, well-read uh, people. I thought it was really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, people were afraid to ask me questions. <laughs> But um, but this it's going to be interesting this Thursday because I'm actually launching this book at the City College of San Francisco oh. as a keynote. And then, um, so the contributors, um, so four people who contributed to the book is going to be at the book launch to read an excerpt uh, from their chapter um, and followed by a screening of uh, first impressions. Okay. And, you know, and then uh, the lecture is uh, uh, hosted by the Department for... Uh, Oceania and Pacific Studies, and it's under the interdiscipl interdisciplinary studies at the college. So, um, and it's upon it's an opportunity for the Pacific students to bring their family along uh, to the book launch. So, this is going to be a very very interesting audience. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Did you uh, go back to your Hi. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for being here on Turtle Island. I'm so grateful that we, I get to catch you. Um, and thank you for the work that you do for our people. Um, I wanted to have three questions, my bad. Um, Kiana? Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, so my three questions are, uh, are there opportunities to get the book uh, translated into Samoan, uh, and shoot, I forget the second question. The third question is, do you find that our people play into these binaries of uh, Fafafine, Fafatama, um, and if that's connected, if we do play into these binaries, is that connected to the language being translated from English to Samoan too. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is, is that within the Fafafili categories, there are subcategories, mm -hmm. you know. Um, um, so there's, there's, you know, there's, there's many, many terms to describe a shade of sexuality and shades of gender beyond Fafatama and Fafafili. Um, so they're all in uh, the introduction um, in the book. Okay. Yes, so it's for these guys, right? So, um, yes, so if you read the introduction of the book, uh, my co-editor, Dan Talaba McMullen, who is a Samoan American, um, you know, writes uh, descriptively about um, all the translations of, of uh, gender and sexual categories in, in the Samoan cosmology, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I just mentioned Fa'atama and, uh, you know, Fa'afine and Fa'atama, uh, you know, as kind of like a, a slice of a broader uh, dictionary of, of, of languages. Yeah. yeah. People are wondering when you're coming to Hawaii. I, I did. Remember we've been in what Hawaii? Oh, you mean the book launch? Yeah. Okay, so this is Kiana Rivera. She has a chapter in the book. 
And then, uh, so uh, her chapter is called Pussy, and then uh, it's actually uh, uh, the, a play that she wrote. So we actually published two plays in the book, and then she's one of the, uh, her plays in the book. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about Pussy? I just ad hoc can say something. Oh, okay. So Pussy is um, <laughs> a play about a girl uh, named Mele, and I wanted to do something in honor of Samoans in the diaspora, and uh, specifically in Hawaii. And it's her struggle of uh, coming out and dealing with her grandmother, who's a Jehovah's Witness, uh, yeah. and trying to find love within all of those walls. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious. Can I tell you a story? Yes. So um, the Samoa Stationery Books, which is SAP, which is like a, it's a stationery uh, chain, deep chain in, in the island. So I met with the CEO. Her name's uh, Fitzy Langwai. And then so um, I came to ask for Fiti if she could support the launch uh, because uh, she expressed interest in uh, stocking the book. And then so she, I gave her the book, and then she opened... Uh, she opened just a random page. It happened to be your chapter, and then she she read. You know, it's just it's like a, you know, like a straight conservative Christian woman grabbed the book and just opened just like random page, and then saw it happened to be your chapter, and then saw like a couple of your sentences about Tina Turner, and she kept on reading and, and talked. To, you know, like because she, there's lots of sexual innuendos in her chapter. She said, "Yes, I want to be the exclusive stockist of this book." <laughs> Honest to God, on whatever God you put, you know, honest, honest to like my grandmother's grave. That's what happened. Yeah. You know, I thought she would be like, oh my gosh, look at all this like vulgar language. And I was like, I want to be the only one that's stocking this book in the end. Yeah, based on your couple of sentences from your chapter, Gail. Yeah, isn't it amazing? Thank you for sharing this. That's okay. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can buy the book by Googling. Um, uh, Samoa Queer Lives, uh, Little Island Press. Um, so uh, you can order the book directly from them, or you can also order it from Amazon. Yeah. And then so, yeah, so, uh, you know, I make regalia, I make video, I edit books. I do everything. <laughs> yeah. And it's all part and parcel of my practice. Like, you know, I'm, you know like in me editing a book, it not, it's not necessarily about trying to embark on a new career. You know what I mean? It's all part and parcel of my art practice. Yeah, that happens to be interdisciplinary. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you so much. Oh, maybe there's oh, one more over there. Oh, That's the last one. Just, just to end it out, I would, I'm curious as to what advice you'd give to like a young, striving artist who is like potentially intimidated by Western-centric art. Like what? Okay, yeah, very easy. Yeah, you need to f define who your audience is. Yeah. Once you know who your audience is, then you know who you're making it for. Yeah. Okay. See you all tomorrow. Thank you.